Greetings friends, David Marks here with the second tutorial in my revamp series on how to set the exposure properly using Adobe Photoshop Lightroom Classic. If image processing with Lightroom is new for you, then I urge you to start with the first video in this series. Start with the first one please, if you're a Lightroom beginner, because in this video I'm going to jump right into the advanced stuff. Without further ado then, let's get started. If you are already familiar with the basics in Lightroom, then you know that properly adjusting these sliders, the exposure controls, in the middle of Lightroom Classic's basic panel are an essential step in our image processing workflow. Recently, Adobe completely revamped the auto button that lives up here in the develop module's basic panel. On the average image, I believe that starting with the right camera profile and then tapping on this auto button is a fine way to get started. When you press auto, Lightroom uses new machine learning based algorithms to set all of these luminance sliders for you. By carefully positioning the blacks, whites, shadows, highlights, exposure, and contrast sliders, we can control the overall brightness of our image. On the average image, auto usually works pretty well, but it doesn't work every time. So today, let's talk about setting these sliders with real precision. The very first thing I'm going to do here may seem unrelated to these exposure sliders, but trust me, because it makes a difference. The first step in a modern professional grade image processing workflow with Lightroom is to pick the camera profile that we want to use from the top of this panel. I'm going to go with the Adobe Landscape profile for this one, since Landscape will add more saturation and more contrast into the baseline interpretation of this raw image's data. Those words, more contrast, means that this profile automatically moves some of the darkest tones in this image further out towards inky black and some of the brightest up towards paper white. It's pretty subtle, but watch what happens to the histogram up here in the top right corner of the screen if I were to select, say, the Adobe Neutral profile instead. See how choosing Neutral, which means far less contrast, far less saturation, moves more of the gray part of the histogram in towards the middle? More gray in the middle equals lower contrast, whereas the Landscape profile moves the histogram out towards the edges. These changes to the overall brightness are one of the reasons why I believe you should always start by making a camera profile choice before proceeding on to any of Lightroom's other sliders. The next thing I need to point out here are these little triangles in the top corners of the histogram. If I position the mouse over the triangle on the right, for example, then a red blob will appear all over the brightest parts of my image. This is the highlight clipping indicator. That red blob represents the areas in this photo that are currently white without detail. Likewise, if I move the mouse over the triangle on the other side of the histogram, then some blue dots will appear. That blue stripe down at the very bottom, that stripe covers over the areas in this image that are currently black without any detail. By the way, when I say move the mouse over these triangles, I mean just that. I mean position the mouse on top of these, but I urge you not to click on the triangles themselves. I urge you not to click the left button on your mouse on either of these triangles because clicking the mouse here, quote, locks the clipping indicator on. Just to show you what I mean, I'm going to do exactly what I'm telling you not to do with a left click and then I'll move the mouse away. See how the red blob is still visible even though I'm no longer hovering over the indicator? That's what locked on means in this context. To turn this feature back off, I need to go back up to the indicator with the little box around it now and left click again. It's not that I don't like these indicators, but trust me, there's a far better way to activate this function. The better way to temporarily lock the clipping indicators on or off is to press the letter J on your keyboard. This is a place where the keyboard shortcut in Lightroom is better than what we can do with the mouse. Pressing J locks both the white and black clipping indicators on, and pressing J turns them off again. Now that we have that bit of mechanics out of the way, I'm going to press the letter J to lock these on, and then I'll show you why these clipping indicators are so useful. My goal when I'm working with the average landscape image like this one is to get as much detail as I possibly can out of my shadows and my highlights. As a general rule, that means that we want to move the whites and black sliders first so that our image's tonal range extends from almost inky black all the way up to almost paper white. After we have set our endpoints, our absolutes, 
with the whites and blacks control. Then we can use all of the other sliders to bring out additional details that might otherwise be lost in the darker or brighter regions of our image. Now, since this one was shot in super high contrast lighting, right at sunset, we already have some pixels that are inky black and some that are paper white. So with the clipping indicators turned on, I'm gonna move the black slider down just a smidgen. Somewhere around negative five, seems right in this photo. Any further, and I'd lose something that I want to see. Next, I'm going to skip over the white slider, and I'm going to go right up to the highlights control. I'm going to leave the whites at zero for now, because this image already has plenty of pixels that are currently paper white. For the highlights, I'm going to slide this slider down to a negative value, so that most of the red blob, which is our overexposure warning, disappears around negative 15 or so, seems about right here. Next, I'm gonna bring the shadow slider way up to draw a whole lot more detail out of the leaves and plants in the foreground. About 60 looks pretty good to me for this one. Now, I'm gonna try and milk even more detail to this image by adjusting the exposure slider up a tiny bit. When I do this, I end up pushing a few of the brightest pixels back to paper white. So to counter that detail loss, I'm gonna bring the highlight slider down a little further to the left until all of the red, the overexposure warning, disappears again. Now do you see why these indicators are so useful? I think that this image looks great now. So I'm gonna press the letter J on my keyboard to unlock the clipping indicators. Next, I'm gonna press the letter Y on my keyboard so that you can see a complete before and after comparison where my original raw capture is on the left and my tuned up version is on the right. It looks to me like we did great precise work here and I love how much detail we now have in the dark plants at the bottom and in some of the sky. Well, now that you've seen this method of setting these luminance sliders with precision, let me show you an alternative. This photo is from one of the beautiful lighthouses that my students and I visit each year during my coastal Maine photography workshop. Like the last image, this is a photo where I need to be very careful how I position each of these sliders. To get started, I'm going to choose to get started, I'm going to choose that Adobe landscape profile again. And next, I'm going to change the white balance here to daylight. I'm going to change it to daylight because I think that the original photo was a little too yellow on my screen. White balance is a whole other topic, and of course it's one that I cover at length in a separate video tutorial. So let's skip that for now. Anyway, now we're ready to set the white and black points for this image. I always begin my exposure adjustments by thinking about the whites and black sliders because they set the absolute ends of our luminance spectrum. I think of these controls like the steel girders that support a skyscraper. If you don't get these right, then the whole image will lack punch or pizzazz. This time though, instead of locking on the clipping indicators, I'm going to hold down the Alt key on my keyboard. PC folks, that's the Alt key for you. And Mac folks, this is the button on your keyboard that's usually two over from the spacebar. Depending on what keyboard you're using on a Mac, this one is either labeled Alt or option. When I hold down the Alt key with my non-mousing hand, and then I begin to drag the black slider, the screen will turn all white. White, in this case, represents the parts of the image that are currently not inky black. As I slide this slider to the left, eventually some colored dots will appear. Think of these colored dots as early warning indicators. These dots cover over the regions that will soon be inky black. Of course, if I keep moving this slider to the left, then these areas will soon turn completely black too. So in this case, I'm going to set this to about negative 10 because that's where we start to get our first little black dots. When I let go of the Alt key, you can see that these parts of the image have indeed gotten darker. My goal here is to set the black point using this slider so that only a couple of insignificant areas in the darkest shadows under those sea roses are truly black without detail. Next, I'm gonna do the same thing with the white slider. Holding down the Alt, Alt Option key, and dragging the white slider up will turn the screen all black. Black in this case 
represents the areas in this image that are not yet white without detail. As I drag this one up, you can see that a big white hole will eventually appear in the upper right corner of the sky. That white area is the part of the image where there are now pixels that are completely blank. So let's set this to something reasonable. Yeah, about seven, I think, we will do here. Next, I'm going to use the Alt-Click trick again on the Exposure slider to make the whole image a tiny bit brighter. Again, I'm doing this with the Alt key held down because I really appreciate the extra info that the live clipping indicators give me. I need that kind of feedback so that I blow out as little of the sky as possible when I'm brightening up this image. Now, it's time to fine tune the in-between values. The order here of shadows then highlights, or highlights then shadows, doesn't really matter. But once again, the Alt trick is invaluable. I'm going to Alt click on the highlight slider, and I'm going to drag this one down to try to restore as much detail as I can to our brightest highlights. Finally, I'm going to move the shadow slider up to bring out a whole more detail in the dark foreground. Now, I could use the Alt trick here, but I don't need to because I'm in no danger of blowing anything out or blocking anything up with this control as long as I move it in a positive direction. Now, we have a good looking image. You can see the complete before and after. I hope that you can see now what a tremendous difference we've made here using just these six controls in Lightroom's basic panel. Before we move on to our last example, let me also point out how well we've placed the silver portion of the histogram. Do you see how the silver part of the histogram, which represents the overall luminance of this image, now extends all the way from inky black to just inside of paper white? There is no perfect shape for your histogram, but its placement, something like this, where the silver part crosses the whole tonal scale, is what we want on the average image. One more example. Remember back in the beginning, when I said that you were going to need these precision skills for the times when auto gives you lousy results? Well, this backlit photo of my niece is a prime example of a time when Lightroom's auto button just gets it wrong. Let me show you what I mean. First, I'm going to set the profile here to Adobe Portrait. The portrait profile lowers the initial level of contrast and saturation a tiny bit, but the big mistake comes in when I hit auto. As you can see, Lightroom made it much darker. Auto seems to think that the details in the background are more important than the details in her face, so the results look way too dark for me. I'm going to undo the mess that Auto made by holding down that Alt, Alt Option key on a Mac, and then clicking on the Reset Tone button that just appeared. Now, I could press the letter J to lock on the clipping indicators, or I could turn off the clipping indicators and use the live preview, that alt click and drag trick instead. Either method is fine, but let's use the alt click and drag this time because it's my favorite. Starting with the black slider again, I'm going to hold down the alt key with one hand and click and drag. When black dots start to appear, I know that I've gone way too far, especially since this is a child portrait. The black dots in this case would be details in her hair that I'm crushing all the way to inky black. There's no need for that, so I'm going to back this one off to something reasonable. Next, I'm going to Alt-click on the white slider. Before I start to move this one, you can see that there's already a large part of this image that is paper white. In a backlit scene like this, pushing the white slider brighter will not help me at all. If anything, I might move the whites down. I might drag this slider to the left to try to recover a little bit of fringe detail from the brighter regions. Now, in a scene like this, it's always tempting to move the white slider way down, but doing so usually creates results that look unnatural. So I'm going to leave this one at about negative 35. Next, I'm going to alt click on the exposure slider to make the overall image a decimal brighter. Now, Let's see how much highlight info we can get back. That highlight slider is amazing. And finally, I'm going to boost up the shadows a bit to bring more light 
into the dark regions of her face and her hair. This looks good to me. To see a complete before and after, I'm going to tap on the backslash key on my keyboard. That was my original capture. And this is where we are now, now that I've carefully brightened up the whole image. Before, after. Let me show you one more comparison real quick. To do this, I'm going to press the letter Y, but I've set things up so that the results on the left are what Auto gave us, and what's on the right is the image that I've sculpted myself. To me, there's no comparison here. Lightroom's Auto command missed the mark, and it created an image where our subject, my niece's adorable face, is way too dark. Well, there you go. Now, not every image is going to require the use of the alt-click trick or the clipping indicators. Not every photo needs such editing precision, but when it really matters, now you know what to do. I hope that you found this deep dive into setting the exposure helpful. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in our next tutorial.